Yeah, the temperature is going up and down this evening. I'm sure we should get rid of them. Can I ask you if you've got any mobile phones or anything else that bleeps? It makes funny noises if you turn them off. Uh, um, well, no need for me to introduce it. Linda Mumma is going to talk to us about one of the warmer models. So I'll leave it to you, Linda. Oh, Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is the first time I've spoken in this room, so let's just make sure that you can hear me at the back. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yep. 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 We have a young gentleman at the back that's filming me. Um, I'm just going to forget he's there. So the rest of you will just be the backs of your heads, so you don't need to worry about it. I've got my notes here, and I will be referring to them this evening, which is not the way I normally do a talk, because generally I've got it all up here, but this one is a little bit more complicated, and I've got a lot of quotes and pieces out of newspapers that I've written down so that I need to read them out to you. So you have to forgive me if I keep swooping down on my notes and reading out of it. Hopefully you'll be able to see everything that I'm talking about up on the screen and uh, you'll be able to read along with me. Maybe. Right, I introduce myself as, uh, as I was kindly introduced. I'm Linda Hutton. I've been investigating my own family history for over 20 years. I have two degrees in history from the Open University, and I'm two sounds a bit greedy, but I couldn't afford a master's degree, so I did another one. Um, I have been researching these memorials for the last <coughs> year. I was asked by Brian if I could think of a topic for a talk, and as he wanted to book me for November, uh, something to do with World War One seemed appropriate. And then it just sort of mushroomed from there, and I'll explain more about that later. Um, I did think that what I would do would be just to look at a few memorials in Barnsley and show you some pretty pictures and talk about them. And then, as I spent week after week after week in Barnsley archives, which is just down the corridor, I'm sure you all know that, it became apparent that there was another angle that I could take on this talk and it's all to do with the little differences of opinion, the little stories, the little why did things happen in a certain way that occurred in Barnsley nearly a hundred years ago just after the First World War. So this talk is about what I found in Barnsley archives and I warn you it scratches the surface if I don't mention your local war <coughs> memorial, I'm really sorry. Um, I've tried to squeeze in as many as I can, but what you might not be aware is that there's an awful lot. Um, people on that road don't say anything. <laughs> you don't say anything. And I just told this gentleman here, how many war memorials do you think there might be in Barnsley? From Thurgo Land to Thurnscoe. Mm. 20. 50. 20, 50. 100. 100. 100. 100. 100. 35. Would it surprise you to know there's over 450? <laughs> I'm going to cover what we think about war memorials today. I'm going to just dig into the first. First World War, the Great War, so that you know what we're talking about. I'm going to look at what people thought about the Great War and the way that they remembered it. Duty, honour, sacrifice and memory. And then I'm going to look at the stories. We've got class conflict. We've got warnings. We've got <coughs> problems with sustainability and affordability. Oh, it all sounds very modern, doesn't it? And then at the very end, I'm going to look at what it means to us today, what our memorials are for. You'll all be familiar with this memorial. You may even have walked past it this evening. What a lot of people don't realise is that there are no names on this war memorial. It 
was erected in 1925 and the sculptor of the figure of the man on top was a John Tweed. He was very well known. He also did a memorial uh, for Clive of India and he did the Captain Cook memorial in Whitby as well. Very well known. Um, one of the most recent war memorials we've got in Barnsley is this one which was put up a couple of months ago in the Barnsley Palace Centenary Garden. Now it was erected glass panels in the flower beds and it's not actually meant to be read. I did have an email from a gentleman that said it's the worst informational panel I've ever seen. Um, but a quote from the designer, she said, it's designed to encourage quiet contemplation. The pieces contain images from the time of the war displayed in layers to form an abstract effect. So it's very pretty and you're not meant to read it. But you can if it's on the screen. Yeah. But that's one of our most recent war memorials and I'll touch upon a few more as I go through. War memorials today. Why are they in the news? Well obviously it's the centenary, we all know that. We've had a lot of that this weekend. Um, but also Afghanistan, Iraq, the losses that we've suffered in those conflicts. I think that we do understand more now how our ancestors felt a hundred years ago. I can remember being in Sheffield 30 years ago, walking down Fargate one morning, and all of a sudden everybody around me just stopped. And I had no idea what was going on, because I was young and ignorant, and gentlemen took their hats off and put their hands on their hearts, and ladies bowed their heads, and everybody was very quiet, and all of a sudden, I twigged. It was the morning of the 11th of November, and the hooter had gone off, which I'd not really noticed, because it does that a lot in Sheffield, and they'd all gone quiet and respectful for the two-minute silence. Now I know we still do the two minute silence on Remembrance Sunday and it is partially observed on the 11th of the 11th but I don't think people stop like they used to. Maybe this year they will. It'll be interesting to see. But 30 years ago the buses stopped, the cars stopped, everybody stopped. And why was that? Because we just had the Falklands War. And we were aware, as we are now, that our young men were going away from our country and fighting in far off places and possibly not coming back. And I think this year we might see a bit of a return to that respectful observance on, as I noticed it uh, called in the co op this morning, Armistice Tuesday. Hmm, okay. <laughs> Armistice Wednesday next year. Because we've got to meet here in between. Now, this is where I have to read my notes. I've tried to write this in a very accessible way. You'll have to forgive me if I've put a few long words in. That will be those degrees sticking their ugly heads up above the parapet. War memorials today provide a focus for reflection on the sacrifice of others. A sacrifice made for our benefit. Remembrance often focuses on recent events, on the soldiers we have known who have been killed or wounded. The fundraising of the Royal British Legion is to support ex-servicemen and current servicemen and their, their families. However, in these centenary years, as more memorials are receiving refurbishments, as more research is being undertaken on the stories of the men and the women who served in the previous wars, and books are appearing which bring these stories to a wider audience, I think we're beginning to think what is it all about? And in my research, I've discovered some of the reasons behind the proliferation of memorials that we have in Barnsley to the First World War. One purpose of a memorial is to outlive the memory of the people that it was built by, and to carry the message embodied by it down through the years to future generations so that it is not lost. Do we understand the messages our ancestors intended us to take from these memorials? 
Memorials can also be part of the healing processes after a disaster. And the Great War was certainly a disaster. <coughs> now, when you think of the First World War, I did a talk the other day to children at Berkwood School in Cuddleth. Half an hour, very quick, lots of pictures. And I've actually took this slide out of that talk that I did for the children. So this will be all right. When you think of the First World War, what image leaps into your mind? Do you think of the assassination of the Archduke of Austria and his wife in that car in Sarajevo? Do you think of Kitchener and his finger following him around the room, asking those men to come forward and volunteer for the PALS battalions? Do you think of those men going over the top? And how many times have we seen this picture on the telly in the last week? Do you think the BBC have only got one clip? I might have to change the picture. Or do you think of those beautiful cemeteries over in France and Belgium, and all over the world for that matter? This is Tyne Cot. Or this year, do you think about those poppies? in the moat at the Tower of London. One for every one of the casualties. My husband's been desperate to take me down there and look at them, but um, it's a long way to London, we've still got some poppies. I'll make do with looking at them on the town. A few statistics. I was surprised at these actually, I had to double check this morning. I was, did I get that right when I was proofreading this? Um, the First World War, the Great War, the European War, also called the War to End All Wars. That's a shame, that wasn't right. It lasted for <coughs> four years, three months and 14 days. There were nearly one million British and Commonwealth dead, 888,246 <coughs> at the Tower of London. Over half a million men have no known grave. That's an awful lot. And they're remembered on the huge memorials at the Menin Gate, on Tyne Cot and Teakwell. Over two million were wounded, many of these dying after the war, but before their time was due, before they're allotted three score years and ten. And I've mentioned the volunteer movement at the beginning of the war, but don't forget that the men that died first were the men that were in the regular army the men that were in the territorials, the men that had been in the army and then had gone back home and were in the reserve. These were experienced soldiers. These weren't young men. These weren't your 18 and 19 year olds and your, your boy soldiers. These were the men that we could have done with later on to teach the boy soldiers how to manage, how not to stick their heads up above the parapet and how to make sure they got two pairs of socks on and the big newspaper stuffed in between. Of course, by 1916, there was conscription, <coughs> which touched every man, potentially, in the country between the ages of 18 and 50 by the end of the war. So don't tell me that you haven't got a soldier in your family, because I think you'll all find that you have. Might be a great uncle or a first cousin twice removed or something like that, but you will have one. I can guarantee you that. During the war, there was already a movement to recognise the sacrifice made by the men that went across to France, Belgium, to Gallipoli, to Africa, to Mesopotamia, to all the other places that our men went to. Um, this is a plaque at uh, Wentworth Castle, Stainborough, and it commemorates, as it happened, the men who from the staff there had signed up to Kitchener's Army. And it was obviously done as they went because the names are not in alphabetical order. They're just higglesy higglesy. So we've got a, a B, a broadhead, towards the end. Oh, I've got a point of broadhead. So I think these names were listed as they went. And then we've got men serving in the territorial force and right at the bottom a couple of Royal Navy men. Apparently this was nearly thrown on a bonfire. That's shocking, isn't it? This is in Darfield. The original of this was a wooden structure with a figure of Christ on, a, on the cross. 
and it was put in place by the local landowner, uh, a Mr. Taylor of Middlewood Hall, to uh, commemorate the loss of his son and various other men from Darfield who'd fallen in the war, and presumably after the war, replaced by this more permanent stone structure. It's on the main road, going from Barnsley to Doncaster, as you go down the hill, just before you get to the River Dern at the bottom, look to your right-hand side, and it's hidden in amongst the trees. This is a memorial window at Darfield for, that, for the son of the vicar, uh, Charles Clifton Mallon Sorby. He was only a young chap, an officer of course, as all the well-bred young men were, killed while rescuing his sergeant, who had been shot and was lying in no man's land. Apparently he put his body between his sergeant and the bullets. His sergeant survived. Charles Sorby did not. And also, in churches around the district, we've got individual memorials. Don't read the words next time you go into church, because these aren't all medieval, these aren't all commemorating landowners. This one's to a private Tom Lockwood. He had a good write-up in the Chronicle. And he won a bravery award, the Distinguished Condor Medal, and an Order of St George from the Russians. I don't actually know what he did, but whatever it was, the people in Highland Swain thought it was worthwhile putting a plaque up to him in their church. So, <coughs> things were happening in Barnsley throughout the war. People were remembering the people that were lost. You have to think that before the First World War, it wasn't normal to have war memorials. There's one in St Mary's to the Boer War, there's one at Moonwell on the side of the town hall. But generally, ordinary soldiers were not remembered. Officers possibly by the sort of plaques that we've seen, the sort of <coughs> memorials to the vicar's son, the local landowner. But ordinary soldiers hadn't been generally remembered before. But this war went on and on and involved so many people that there was a huge groundswell of, of movement amongst the ordinary people of Barnsley wanting something to remember their young men by. And the government had stepped in pretty quick and said that bodies will not be repatriated. One or two slipped back. <coughs> it's all surprised if a few more weren't smuggled back by really wealthy families later. But in the main, we were all made quite aware that it was just not possible to bring the bodies back. This was probably quite tactful by the government because when the men were lost with no known grave, there's no hope of bringing the body back. So. You will sometimes see pieces in the newspapers where comrades report that their friend has been buried in a lovely grassy glade with flowers around the grave and, and the, the army chaplain said a few words and actually, you know, he was buried alive when his tunnel that he was digging under Hill 60 collapsed. But the family didn't know that. Certainly didn't know it until a lot later and they were being happier knowing, thinking that he's got a grave. Some, some men did have a grave, and then of course the battle moved across it. The Germans took over that bit of land, or we advanced away from it, and maybe an artillery shell landed slap bang on it, and then there wasn't a grave anymore. So what we needed was something at home for people to go to, to think about their lost boys, their sons, their brothers. I found newspaper cuttings dating back as far as September 1916 from Cuddeth. Um, the townspeople wanted a memorial and the local council said, after a friendly discussion, the council unanimously agreed to raise no objection to the proposed memorial, but in all probability a public memorial scheme will emanate from the council at a later date. So, yes, you nice people in Cuddeth, you could have your memorial, but we'll have a better one because we're the council. In Doddeth, I'm just looking to see if the Doddethy people are here this evening. I think they are. Um, in Doddeth there were two schemes. There was the council scheme and there was the Doddeth Bottom Gardener Society scheme, which was a lot of miners who were raising money to have another memorial. And to start with, they were all, both raising money side by side or in competition with each other, whist drives, pie and peas, beetle drives, all sorts of things. And then eventually they did decide to put together. Whew, much more sensible. Royston, same problem. 
Um, the church committee have decided to erect a memorial in the old churchyard in memory of the brave lads. Mm -hmm. The council instructed the clerk's reply stating that they were already committed to a scheme and for that reason they would not join in with the proposal of a similar character. So again, we've got the people's movement for war memorials and the council saying, no, 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 we'll take care of it. In Royston, they also appear to have reconciled by the time the memorial was erected. There were lots and lots of what we would think today are slightly cockeyed suggestions, and some would sound a bit sensible. Most of them didn't seem to happen. Um, I found a, a cutting in the Barnsley Independent that referred to a collection of photographs of officers and men for exhibition in the Cooper Art Gallery. If there's anybody that knows the Cooper Art Gallery inside out and has seen a big box full of photographs, it could be those men, because I'm sure some of them will have been sent in. But as far as I know, nothing came of that suggestion. So maybe they didn't get enough for an exhibition. Um, there was a proposal by various councillors that everybody should contribute towards beds in Beckett Hospital, which is fair enough. Um, but they got a wall over towards that, so they didn't really need us to put in our pennies. And um, Dobberth suggested planting a tree for every man with a plaque on it, with his name. And in Wombwell, there was a proposal for a park. And I gather there is a corner of Wombwell Park that used to be a memorial garden. But I don't know, I don't know Wombwell very well, but... Um, ooh, that was good. If anybody does know Wombwell Park, and I'm looking a couple of rows back, could they go and have a look and see if there's any indication that this was or has been at any point the memorial park there because it would be nice. There's a bit on the council website that says there was, but I couldn't find any picture. In 1917, the council's obviously got a plan because the town clerk appeals in the Chronicle two weeks on the trot for the full names of all Barnsley sailors and soldiers. Um, apparently the response had been very gratifying but some people hadn't put their home address on the postcards, so he appeals again. <coughs> so there was a plan, there was some sort, of, sort of plan. Who were the people that were thinking about erecting these memorials? We've got the parish and town ship authorities, the parish council, the urban district councils. We've got the local churches and chapels, they were sources of, of community in the areas. And we've got the servicemen's organisations, not the British Legion yet, because they don't come in until the 1920s, but we've got the Comrades of the Great War and the Association and the, there's another one, the Federation, I think, of Disabled and Discharged Soldiers and Sailors. They're very long names, very long names. And it's all available, one row and another. And who, who really, really wanted to remember these men for their own purposes? The widows the parents, the children. Now, why would people want to remember their fallen men? Well, they were honouring them, as my heading suggests. And I've got a few examples of, of war memorials that, that sort of look at different aspects of why we wish we would erect them. So, Barnsley War Memorial outside of the front says, in honoured memory of the men and women, which is very egalitarian of them, of Barnsley. The role of honour in Monk Breton Working Men's Club, which is this picture here, shows a very patriotic Tommy standing in front of a Union flag. So there's the honouring the dead aspect of it. The Barnsley War Memorial has also got a figure on the back facing the town hall of a wind victory. Some towns have got a victory figure on the top. And these figures suggest that the peace was achieved through victory, that the purpose of the struggle and that of those who died was the achievement of the peace. And images of St George were also quite common because he represents victory over evil. So this is a St. George, killing the dragon, from the window at the Holy Trinity Church at Alsica. The self-sacrifice of the dead <coughs> was said to have made the most crucial contribution to the victory. 
By becoming the victims of the war, they had triumphed over it. The Barnsley War Memorial says, those who laid down their lives in the Great War. And as I'm sure you've heard this weekend, other memorials often quote the words from St John's Gospel, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And this evokes the collective virtue of the comradeship of war, <coughs> the solidarity of the fighting men, of the band of brothers. And this is a picture from the centre of the Roll of Honour at Grimethorpe Working Men's Club. It is the most beautiful memorial <coughs> I've ever seen. It's about 10 foot wide by 5 foot high, and it takes up the entire wall of the function room upstairs. Um, they're anonymous men, they have no faces, but one is clearly helping another who's wounded, and they're walking through a recognisable battlefield with blasted trees and mud on the ground. This reminds us of the horror of the war. And reminding us of the horrors, the memorials also ask us to ensure that such things are never allowed to happen again. And the Barnsley War Memorial states, and we in faith keep that peace for which they paid. The first war memorial outside, public, not one in a church, the first war memorial that I can find a record of that was erected in Barnsley, in the what they call the, um, the old area, appears to have been Royston's in the churchyard, which was, as you can see, unveiled before the war had ended, on the fourth anniversary of the start of the war, quite appropriately. At that point, it had no names upon it, and the names, 96 names, 96 names, were not added until 1922. Royston Local History Group have done a book about the war, which I've brought with me this evening, if anybody wants to have a look in the break. And I did oddly find a mention in December 1924 that a meeting was called about um, a public memorial in Royston um, to, to money to be raised by public subscription. And I think this is the churchyard memorial, because it's obviously in the churchyard, and that the one that they're talking about in 1924 is possibly that council one, which I thought they might have reconciled with each other and decided to only have one, but the council were having one last gasp at trying to have their own memorial before they gave up. Certainly there's no further mention of it in the newspapers. Now, the, the groups of people that could have memorials, including Barnsley sportsmen, and the Shorelands trustees agreed a lease of some land as a memorial to the sportsmen who made a great sacrifice in the war. And they decided that as part of this memorial park, it was 286 square yards. And I'm afraid I'm not very good at visualising how big that was, but it's, it's large enough to have a tennis court or a bowling green or something. I don't think it's all of the, the Shore, uh, Shore Lane Sports Club that we have now, but it must be a fair part of it. They decided to have the war memorial at the entrance to the ground. And this runic cross of Aberdeen granite was unveiled in 1923. <laughs> and wreaths were laid at the opening by the football club, the cricket club, the golf club, the bowling club and the tennis club. However, the following week in the Chronicle, there were slightly peeved letters from the rugby club and the hockey club who were complaining that they'd been left out. <laughs> The week after that, there was a response from the secretary of the Sportsman's Memorial Club pointing out that they were left out because they hadn't subscribed to the fund. <laughs> this is just the beginning of these funny little petty recriminations that, that seem to dog war memorials. It make, makes researching them amusing, but could they have risen above them? Now, I've headed this slide, class and conflict, because I think that the upper classes had a little bit of a different idea about what was suitable than the, than the ordinary working man. Uh, Colonel Hewitt, who <coughs> lost a couple, lost a couple? Yes, lost a couple of sons himself, 
in the war, suggested at a, a gala at Gorba in 1918 that the idea of perpetuating their memory was one which must appeal to all of them at home. He considered the best scheme of all would be for each district to endow a bed at the Beckett Hospital and to name the bed after the village which should subscribe to the cost. A falls. Oh yeah, I suppose it. Imagine somebody holding up a plastic cup now, Colonel Hewitt says. Um, oddly, I think that they changed their minds later on, the, the other classes, because I've seen... Well, we'll get to that. Um, Gorba had its own memorial eventually, and they may have subscribed to some beds at Beckett Hospital, but they certainly wanted their own memorial where they could lay their own wreaths with the names of their own men. And I think that the, <coughs> the, the Hewitts, the Rayleighs, the Huggards, and the Elmhursts of Bones, they possibly forgot that that was necessary. They've got plaques in their churches to their boys, after all. In Mulbreton, the, uh, the council got together and decided fairly unilaterally that they were having three memorial windows in St Paul's, that's the church at, at the top of Mulbreton, one each from Mulbreton, Smithies and Old Mill, with brass tablets inside and a stone slab outside. Same as it has brass tablets, stone slab. This um, grocer, Joseph Dodd, writes into the Chronicle the week after this has been announced and says, I think this is an absolute waste of money. This is going to cost £600. We've got widows and children of our ex-servicemen who are scraping a living and you want to spend all of that money on some stained glass windows. That is ridiculous. He says, if the members of the above church want their sacred edifice beautifying in memory of their fallen, I have no objection, provided they do it amongst themselves. And it gets a little bit worse because the following week, a letter appears from a coal miner called Elijah Higgs, who was apparently a nonconformist gentleman from Smithies, and he says, we were informed at the meeting that the cost of the Milk Breton Memorial would be borne by the whole of the township. But they'd already agreed in Smithies that they wouldn't put anything in their chapel unless they could afford to put everything in all of the churches and the chapels. And there were apparently six nonconformist and Anglican places of worship in the township. And here is the council deciding, without really consulting everybody properly, that they'll have three stained glass windows and brass plaques and a stone tablet. Um, Elijah Higgs was quite annoyed. This all happens in 1919. The letters actually go on and on and on in the newspaper on this topic. It, it gets quite, um, quite heated. More alternatives. We're in 1918 now. Well, well, they dibbled in the idea of a park, but then somebody suggested a special hospital for accident cases. Ooh, very early A&E. Um, and a German gun, if they could get their hands on one. And they don't just need a rifle, they need a big artillery gun. Um, the idea of a mining and technical <coughs> school started being put about. I mean, we, we did end up with that. I don't know how it was funded in the end, but it wasn't a war memorial. The people at Stainborough thought they might have parish rooms. The people at Grimethorpe suggested cottages for disabled soldiers. And in Thurlston, they thought they might have a nice village institute. In Barnsley Town Centre, they were coming around to the idea, we're in, we're in 1919 now, that they might have a memorial. And they sent messages out to all of the little townships and said, we want you to subscribe. And Woonwell said, Barnsley got all the praise for raising the Pals battalions. We should not let them have the war memorial as well. Monk Breton said, Barnsley were trying to make something for themselves with the help of the ta out townships. They were always putting forward these mercenary schemes whereby they could get something by voluntary subscriptions from the outlying townships which they ought to have built out of the rates. And they're particularly talking about the hospital and uh, various council offices at this point. And Ardsley just chipped in with, if Barnsley wants a memorial, they can do so, and the other districts will do the same. 
Donneth, it never overwhelms fine. The council's representatives will mm. not support the scheme for the Barnsley and District War Memorial as they have their own memorial. Thank you. So we have a fair amount of conflict between the different parts of Barnsley as well. They're all being very independent. Now you, you'll understand I'm not Barnsley born and bred, but I do understand that some bits of Barnsley are still like that today. Yeah. Quite independent. We'll talk to the other people. Why not? I quite like you having fallen from 50 water miles. Gives me more to do. In the centre of town, the churches, obviously the places where people went to get a little bit of um, reassurance, a bit of, um, um, what's the word after? Help in their sorrow after their son had died. They decided that they would have their own memorials. They weren't going to wait for the town to get round to doing a big one. So in chronological order, we've got St George's as a chapel with special oak panelling, unveiled in 1919. <coughs> I'm afraid we only have a picture of the nibble. And I don't know where that's gone, but I was sent in that picture a few months back. That's St George again. Hasn't got the dragon this time, I don't think. Oh, I don't know, well, there's a poor down there at the bottom. It's not a very good picture, it's very old. St Edward's has a big marble plaque which also gives a nod to the convalescent home <coughs> where men were nursed, all paid for by E.G. Lancaster. Notice that the men on here are listed by full name, in alphabetical order of surname, and no ranks mentioned. Very egalitarian. At St. John's, uh, no, this is St. Peter's, at St. Peter's, down on Doncaster Road, they have a big oak plaque the men are listed by initial and surname, much to, <laughs> much to the lady that's researching its distress, she can't. But at the bottom, these are not men from the Second World War. These are actually names that were added on, and the whole memorial itself was unveiled in June 1921, and 24 extra names were added in November 1921. You heard me accidentally step up and call that St John's. We think the St John's Memorial will have looked something like that. However, the church was demolished and we have no idea what happened to the plaque. If anybody's seen a very large piece of oak with 140 names on it knocking about, please tell somebody. Please. We, we, we would dearly love it. We have the names because they were in a newspaper article when the, the plaque was unveiled. But we'd, we'd love to have the plaque as well. Where was St John's? Um, where the old people's houses are on St. on Joseph Street, the near, near the Buckley Street flats, that area. And finally, St. Mary's Church in town have this very elaborate gothic -y pink thing, um, which was unveiled in 1922. The names are in the little panels there, which are not that little because that's a chair, the scale. So imagine that's about what, how tall is a chair? Three or four, three foot high. Those panels are about three foot high. And they're very, very difficult to photograph, apparently. According to my colleague who photographed. Now, oh no, the answer, no. In Hoyland's you didn't see that. In Hoyland's way, they were very, very democratic. They had several suggestions for what they should have for a memorial. So this wasn't like, the other councils, like Mount Breton, saying what they were going to have without any discussion, they actually sent out ballot papers to everybody in the village. 400 ballot papers, 235 were returned, and the result was for monument with tablet, 178, for a clock on the church, 35, and for a tablet to be placed in the church, 23. They didn't get a monument with tablet, but they got a nice monument. Um, and that was unveiled in 1921, the site having been given by the landowner, and a procession headed by the Thurston Brass Band <coughs> formed at the parish church and marched to the site, where united choirs of the village, relatives of the men, and ex-soldiers, and a military contingent from Pontefract all paid their respects. Evening services were held at both the parish church and the United Methodist Church. That's why this sounds like a nice place, doesn't it? Mm -hmm.
There was a similar scheme at Stainborough, where they also had a vote on what they would vote. <coughs> so we have villages and townships having public meetings. We have them discussing what form they should, their memorial should take. They're working out how will it be paid for. Wish drives, Beetle drives, IMPs, door-to-door -door subscriptions, out of the rates. Who would look after it? A lot of these memorials ended up being given to the local council to maintain. Were the proposals made value for money? Do we really need a memorial? Do we really need a new parish rooms? Do we need a clock? Or were some of the proposals a waste of money in the current economic climate? And my final example before we have a nice cup of tea is from Darfield, where in 1917, a site was offered by the council for a memorial and it was in front of the council offices and the public were asked to subscribe a sum of £500. After a long discussion, a motion was proposed accepting the committee's recommendation. This was opposed by the majority present, many of whom were comrades of the war. Comrades of the War should have capital letters because it was the name of one of the forerunner societies to the British Legion. So the council said, you're having a memorial, it's going to be in front of the council offices and you lot are going to raise £500. And the local ex-servicemen and the local public say, no we're not. We're going to have a committee room, we're going to have a club, we're going to have something that's useful. And the whole thing farmed out to a committee made up of ordinary people. Unfortunately, if you remember your history, you know what happened in the 1920s. Um, trade got bad, there was a bit of a depression, jobs were lost, and by 1920 they were going back to the council and asking for the council to support them out of the rate money because they, they'd actually only raised about £68, which is a place the size of Darfield. And, Surprised. And in 1920, a piece appears in the newspaper in one of the council meetings, but it's all got so heated that they're saying, oh, we're discussing a retreat for the, the aged, a nice place where people can sit and quietly contemplate. We're not discussing a playground, it doesn't have to be huge, it doesn't have to have all my cons. And the whole thing actually got shelved for quite a long time. The plaque in the church was unveiled in 1921. I think the church had decided that the council memorial wasn't going to happen anytime soon, so they put theirs up. This is not quite as egalitarian as the Barnsley examples we've looked at. The men are listed alphabetically by rank. So there's Charles Mallon Clifton Sorby, the vicar's son, and uh, Taylor, the son of the landowner, that that war shrine was originally put up to at the top, and then it goes down through sergeants, corporals, hands, corporals, bombardiers, privates. And um, there's a few navy men scattered in amongst them, in no particular order, but not as equal as others that I've seen. There was a mother's union window unveiled in the church in 1923. And there were also memorials put up in the village club, which is gorgeous. It's got photographs of the men embedded in it. Beautiful. And the conservative club, of which we can find no sign anymore. They didn't get their cenotaph until 1930. And the reason for this delay, as reported in the Barsley Chronicle of the 12th of July 1930, was that when it was first proposed in 1917-18, the landowners and colliery owners were approached to fund it, and they considered the proposal premature. Of course, we were still in the war then. And then the committee, after all of the dispute that we covered a slide back, the committee retired into their shell, apparently, according to the newspaper, or got browbeaten by the local council, more like. And they just faded. Fortunately, in early 1930, the British Legion was successful at getting the members of the old committee back together and rapid progress was made. Subscriptions were collected and in view of the state of the trade, the appeal met with a ready response. 1930? We're even harder up than we were in 1920. And yet they managed to raise all the money for this 
This is huge. If, if I was stood next to it, my head wouldn't come halfway up that bit of the, the road from. That was a very glum day, I'm sorry, when we photographed that. I'm sure it looks better in the sun. The memorial contains 76 names, and the newspaper article says, this would have been much greater if restrictions had not been placed on recruiting in mining areas. Of course, by the time they had conscription, they were also recognising that you can't send all your miners and your, your factory workers to war because we need them here. So men were badged and starved and occupations reserved. Unveiled by Major Riddle, one of these upper class people that had a title from the First World War but didn't actually go anywhere near the war, who suggested it would be a good thing for Great Britain if every town and village had a permanent memorial reminding this generation and generations yet to come of the sacrifice of those resting under foreign soil. Major Riddle had himself visited the trim graves and well-kept cemeteries in France and reassured the relatives that their boys were being well cared for. So the upper classes had changed their tune a little bit by 1930 and realised that the working class men and women, the wives and children, the widows and the mothers that had lost sons needed these memorials and weren't just going to be happy with a bed in Beckett Hospital with a little brass label on. They needed somewhere to put their poppies. If you would now all like to have a comfort break. Mm -hmm. <laughs>